some Fourier series as an undergraduate student. So that means there's a lot of material related to this concept. The author of our textbook attempts to cram the entirety of the experience into a single 15 page section. So it ends up looking like here's an overview of Fourier series from an undergraduate making a crib sheet to study for their final exam. The section is also a bit sparse on examples and the problem seemed to require three to four pages of analysis to complete. I'm gonna do my best with what's here and try to bring it a bit more into focus for you. As a critique, I think this should be an entire chapter of the book rather than a single section. And if I was running this again, I would break this out into its own uh, separate week. So the main idea behind this is that we can use sine and cosine waves and combinations to make other functions. Fourier series decompose periodic functions into linear combination of sines and cosines. This idea has been expanded into an entire branch of mathematics called Fourier analysis. There are also a lot of different application areas, including acoustics, optics, quantum mechanics, signal processing, and vibrating mechanical systems, and more. Uh, and so this is what I would tell you if we were having a cup of coffee at Campus Center, if I ran into an old friend while I was out for a walk who was curious about section 9.4 of Cheney and Kincaid. I doubt that either of these situations would happen, but uh, mathematics is largely theoretical. Uh, Fourier series were introduced by Jean-Baptiste uh, Joseph Fourier. Uh, from, he lived from 1763 to 1830. He did a lot of work on the theory of heat and was the first to come up with the greenhouse effect. He also accompanied Napoleon to Egypt. So, you know, this is basically an overview of Fourier series. So let's take a look at a quick example. So uh, you've probably seen something like this in your 266 or other digital logic classes. In this type of diagram, we can think of high voltages and low voltages that are synchronized to a clock signal. How could we build this using sine and cosine waves? Now, you probably remember sketching something like this in your high school trigonometry class. It's not really our square wave function, but it has some similar ideas with the uh, peaks at 1 and the uh, lows at uh, minus 1. And, you know, we could actually normalize that to uh, 1 and 0 if we wanted to. Um, and this has some of the similar ideas to that square wave function. So what if we add in the term uh, sine of 3x divided by 3 to our original sine wave? Well, we get something that looks a little bit more like our square wave function. You can see the peaks uh, last a bit longer and the uh, lows uh, last a little bit longer. Trans, uh, transformation from low to high, uh, or transition from low to high, is uh, relatively quick in this. So let's uh, add another term in. Uh, this one is sine of x plus sine of 3x divided by 3 plus sine of 5x divided by 5. And that looks even closer. Uh, here it is up to 11, uh, even closer, and up to the limit of what Wolfram will allow you to type in which goes up to the uh, term sine 27x divided by 27. And you can see there that the uh, transition is really, really quick from uh, low to high. And the uh, high stays very close to the one value and the low stays very close to the uh, minus one value. Uh, after about 100 terms, you get something that looks like this. And you can see there's uh, very little uh, variation there. Uh, if we expand the series out infinitely, we would actually get our square wave. Now, what happens if you try this with uh, sine of nx divided by n, sine of nx, cosine nx uh, divided by n, different combinations? And I'm going to leave that last bullet point as an exercise, but you'll probably get some uh, interesting functions. So that's it for the uh, math is fun portion of our lecture. Let's see some more of the advanced mathematics behind this idea, and we'll start looking at this formally. Uh, we established least squares approximation of a continuous function f, which is periodic over the interval minus pi to pi, in the space of the trigonometric polynomials. We showed that it can be spanned by the orthogonal set 1, cosine x, sine x, cosine 2x, sine 2x, all the way up to cosine nx, sine nx, where n is uh, some positive integer. And we can define that space geometrically using the continuous, uh, using the inner product. Any continuous function on f in the interval minus pi to pi can be approximated by linear combinations of the elements from set w, as closely as needed with sufficiently large value of n. We can also construct an orthonormal basis. 
and the vectors in W are mutually orthogonal. <clears throat> the orthonormal basis for the uh, space um, basically tells us that G of X can be uh, approximated uh, using these uh, inner products of the terms in uh, W uh, when they're normalized. And this looks like a mess compared to what we were doing a few slides ago. So uh, let's walk it back a little bit and we'll look at Fourier series. So the nth order Fourier approximation of f of x using the Fourier coefficients a0, an, and bn can be written as a summation of these uh, sines and cosines. This approximation becomes increasingly better as n increases. The Fourier series of f on the interval minus pi to pi is the infinite sum given by this equation. And they can be shown to hold for a wider class of functions such as piecewise continuous functions. In other words, when f is continuous, except uh, perhaps for a finite number of removable or jump discontinuities, um, then we have the uh, Fourier series. And we saw those jump discontinuities in the square wave function earlier where we went from minus 1 to 1 uh, very quickly. Uh, so this is a great formula, but there's a question as to how do we get these uh, coefficients a0, an, and bn. So the Fourier series is given by f of x is equal to 1 half a0 plus the sum of a sub n cosine nx plus b sub n sine nx. And here's how we find the uh, coefficients. The a sub n is uh, one, time, 1 over pi times the integral from minus pi to pi f of x cosine nx dx, and b is the same thing with sine of uh, nx. So let's think about our square wave uh, function again. And uh, we can incorporate a new variable L that is the half period of the function. And this will make our formula more general. Rather than going from minus pi to pi, we can go from minus L to L. Uh, we do have to um, you know, include L um, in this uh, formula, but it makes our formula more general. So uh, let's take a look at another example. So for our square wave function, we set L equal to pi, and then we have an amplitude uh, or height of the square wave to go to H, and then A0 is the integral from minus pi to pi F of X DX, and that one, because half of it's above zero and half of it's below zero, that works out to zero, and in fact, all the A sub I are zero. So A1 is 1 over pi minus pi f of x cosine x. That one equals 0. For the b sub i, we can compute b1 is equal to 4h over pi. b2 is 0. b3 is 4h over 3 pi. b4 is 0. And b5 is 4h over 5 pi. So our series becomes 4h over pi sine of x plus sine of 3x divided by 3 plus sine of 5x divided by 5, and that's how we derive our square wave function. So we can actually, uh, you'll notice a lot of those terms, the a's were all 0, and uh, the evens on the b's were 0. Uh, we can actually take advantage of some of the symmetry in the function and exploit that to reduce the computation effort to finding the Fourier coefficients when we have symmetry about either the vertical axis or the origin. Uh, we can do this by noting the definitions of even and odd functions. And the properties that define even or odd functions are as follows. An even function, uh, f of x, is symmetric with respect to the vertical axis, and f of minus x is equal to f of x. So you can see an even function down there in the uh, lower left. An odd function is symmetric with respect to the origin, and Basically, uh, f of minus x is equal to minus f of x. And you can see an odd in the center. Um, and some of them are neither. So they're neither even nor odd, in which case we have to you know, go about doing the uh, work of calculating all the a n and b n. Uh, the rules for composing uh, functions uh, work as you might expect. Even plus even is even, but odd times odd is equal to even. So there are some um, unusual uh, things in uh, sine of x is odd, and cosine of x is even. Uh, for even functions, you can automatically conclude that the b n coefficients are all zero. So you only have to calculate the 
A sub n coefficients. For the ob functions, you can automatically conclude the A sub n coefficients are all zero, so you only have to calculate the B sub n coefficients. Turns out their square wave, square wave function was an odd function. Uh, yeah, it seems pretty odd to me. Uh, of course, it may turn out that your function is neither even nor odd, and you may have to calculate all those coefficients, in which case it's kind of a uh, sad case. So let's take a look at some more examples. So uh, this one is the uh, sawtooth wave, and this is an odd function, and it's uh, discontinuous at points equal to n times pi. Uh, we take the midpoint of the jump, so f of n times pi is equal to zero, and it's given by this uh, Fourier series here. Uh, the derivation of this takes over a page, and several of the other derivations take equally long, if not longer. Now, this one, when you look at it, it resembles the teeth of a saw blade. Uh, this is one of the best for synthesizing string musical instruments, such as violins or cellos. For example, consider a string length of 2L plucked at the right end and uh, fixed at the left end conform to this uh, square wave function. Another one is the uh, triangle wave function, which is given by this formula. This one is an even function with the cosine series, and it's interesting that it also possesses half-wave symmetry. Uh, finally, uh, we have some important formula that relate the complex numbers and the exponential function to trigonometric identities. They're also extremely useful in Fourier transforms, which decompose functions depending on space or time into functions depending on space or temporal frequency, such as the expression of a musical chord in terms of volume and frequencies of its constituent notes. Fourier transforms can be their own topic, and in fact, uh, they're quite a uh, long topic. So uh, let's take a look at you know, how we can relate uh, the imaginary numbers uh, to this. Uh, four frequencies. So in the complex plane, uh, i is equal to the square root of minus one, and we can do that on one of the axes in the uh, complex plane rather than using just a real number line. And Euler's equation tells e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i times sine of theta, and e to the minus i theta is equal to cosine theta minus i sine theta. And um, we can also see uh, DeMarv's equations, uh, sorry for my uh, French, uh, which uh, relate the uh, general condition, relate the uh, cosines um, raised to uh, powers. And if you look at the equations, they relate the exponential functions to the trigonometric functions in the complex plane, which is pretty cool uh, in and of itself. And that leads us to the famous identity e raised to the i pi is equal to minus one. That's also known as Euler's identity, and I think it's one of the most beautiful equations in mathematics since it relates the transcendental numbers, e and pi, and the imaginary numbers, i, to the negative numbers, minus uh, 1, and unity, 1. So uh, you can actually use these identities to develop Fourier series for complex numbers. And we do that through using the uh, roots of unity, and these arrive with uh, finding the complex roots of the polynomial x raised to the n is equal to 1. So you probably know the fourth roots of unity are 1 minus 1 i and minus i. And basically we can remember that a nth degree polynomial has in complex roots and use those uh, equations from Euler and Dumov to uh, find those uh, roots of unity. And what's interesting is all of them lie in the unit circle on the complex plane which is why we have those trigonometric functions. In fact, the uh, roots are the vertices of a regular n polygon in the complex plane. And uh, for n is greater than or equal to 1, the sum of the nth roots of unity is 0. So that also helps us to uh, find these. And graphically, uh, we can see the different roots of unity, again, inscribed in that unit circle in the uh, complex plane with the uh, regular polygon. So. Uh, for the center one there, we're looking at the third roots of unity, which is a triangle, and that's a three-sided polygon, and we can see where those uh, lie. For the uh, fourth roots of unity, we have um, one minus one i and minus i, and those are a square inscribed inside that uh, unit circle. So roots of unity are pretty cool in and of themselves from a theoretical standpoint. We can take these roots of unity and place them inside a matrix to build a Fourier transform. 
and this Fourier transform de decomposes functions depending on space or time into functions depending on spatial or temporal frequency. And you can find a number of applications in music, physics, and signal processing. Now, typical computation of the Fourier transform is O of n squared, but there are also fast Fourier transforms that can accomplish the process in O of n log n time. Uh, again, you can find a number of applications in music, physics, and signal processing. Uh, typical computation is O of n squared, but there are also the fast Fourier transforms that accomplish this in O of n log n times, and one of those is the cooley uh, tukey fast Fourier transform algorithms, which works by rearranging the input values in bit reversed order and then builds the output transformation. And it's uh, pretty slick. Thanks so much for watching. And hopefully I covered this in uh, a bit less detail, um, but at the same time made it a bit more uh, relatable than uh, what's covered in the text.